Thanks so much, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to the ACP India chapter for inviting me today. And this seems to be a very important topic for all of us as physicians and oncologists, because we know that several, almost 60 to 70% of oncological emergencies are salvageable. 60 to 70% of all cancers are curable. And well, this happens to be the next most emerging problem in not just uh, the entire globe, but very importantly in India, being the second most common uh, non-communicable disease after cardiac ailments. So let me summarize some important cardiac uh, oncological emergencies we come across. And the first important is spinal cord compression. This happens in almost 1 to 5% all systemic cancers. And yes, it can be reversible if it is managed on time. We have to importantly realize whether there's any epidural compression noted in such cases. When do we suspect it? Well, an upper uh, back pain is the most common site. Unlike lower back pain, which may be because of osteoporosis or other ailments. So 70% will have thoracic spinal cord involvement. 20% will have lumbosacral involvement and 10% will have cervical involvement. Now, the most common malignancies which present with some uh, spinal cord compression and no, mostly present to either spinal surgeon or an orthopedician are either lung cancers or breast cancer. These also happen to be the most common cancers uh, overall. Lung and breast combine to be more than 25% of all the cancers. And then, of course, we have prostate cancer, renal cancer, and multiple myelomas, which also present with spinal cord compression. What are the symptoms? Well, there's a localized pain in the spine with also tenderness in that area, which is exacerbated by movement, which is exacerbated by uh, recumbency and coughing, sneezing and straining. There is definitely either a motor or a sensory level noted. It could be associated with autonomic dysfunction like urinary retention and constipation. So what needs to be done? Well, the evaluation generally is physical evaluation and neurological evaluation. You need, need to percuss the uh, spine to find out the exact point of tenderness. A passive neck flexion can be done. A straight leg sign will be positive. As I said, there'll be motor or sensory level noted. And of course, the reflexes could be uh, immediately depressed and later on exaggerated. And we should try to do a rectal examination in most of the situations to find out whether there's any retention of bowel noted. What is the standard investigation? Well, the more, most important is and most commonly done is just an X-ray. But only 66% of such patients will have bony abnormality. And we, of course, know that epidural compression or metastasis may be missed on an X-ray. So the standard remains an MRI of the spine. And it is important to understand that the entire spine should be, should be evaluated. If there's any contraindication to MRI, then a CT scan can be done. What are goals of management of spinal cord compression? Well, the goal uh, basically is to have normal neurological recovery. There should be stabilization of the spine. There should be local tumor control and, of course, immediately pain control. And then we have to determine what is the nature of the tumor. Based on that, the treatment can be decided. So we have to find out whether it is a radiosensitive tumor or not. Immediately, once we have established that there's a spinal cord compression, steroids need to be started with a 10 milligram IV bolus. And then it can be up to 32 milligram per day. Stabilization of the spine and wherever it is a radiosensitive tumor, radiation should be incorporated. Surgery is incorporated when tissue diagnosis is required. And when they are not radiosensitive and spinal stabilization can be done at the same time. Both like surgery and radiation are also done very often. So these are normally all the specialists who are involved when there's a spinal cord compression. The second oncological emergency is superior vena cava syndrome. Now this again happens in the most common cancers which we encounter. Most commonly intrathoracic malignancies account for 60 to 85% of all superior vena cava syndrome. It could be actual infiltration of the SVC or it could be extrinsic compression. And the most common tumors are non-small cell carcinoma of the lung and then small cell cancer of the lung. It could be breast cancer. It could be mediastinal testicular cancer uh, with a mediastinal mass. It could be a thymic carcinoma or a thymoma. And of course, lymphoma in a young adult. 
there could be some non malignant causes like a thrombus this could also be tumor related thrombus and then of course it could be a thyroid goiter which is extending substernally so how we commonly see patients they are they would present with facial edema or erythema they could be dilated uh, veins on the upper body and the neck they could be laryngeal and glossal edema with periorbital swelling cough dyspnea and orthopnea we we know that svc syndrome can result in life threatening cerebral edema or it can cause airway compression and laryngeal edema so how do we diagnose well again a physical thorough uh, examination a chest x ray there can be ultrasound uh, doppler to see the subclavian and the jugular vein there has to be a ct scan in some instances we do bronchoscopy and thoracoscopy here again the goal is to alleviate the symptoms and the underlying disease also so first establish the diagnosis and then wherever necessary either chemotherapy or radiation has to be uh, evaluated as i said malignant svco the most common cause almost 75 to 80% is lung where chemotherapy remains the treatment of choice wherever there is lymphoma established then even steroids are very good therapy the next common presentation to a physician uh, and of course also an oncologist is hypercalcemia of malignancy now this happens in 20% of all calcium uh, uh, of all cancer patients and it could be primarily because of bony metastasis or it could be paraneoplastic most commonly hemopoietic malignancy is very often present with hypercalcemia they can be t cell lymphomas or it could be myelomas then it could be squamous cell carcinoma of the lung squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix it could be kidney cancers with erythropoietin excess or it could be head and neck cancers how do they present most of them would have anorexia and dehydration they'd be constipated they'll have pruritus and weight loss they would have neurological signs like irritability weakness proximal myopathy and altered mentation there could be cardiac changes because of the electrolyte there could be bradycardia or short qt interval and of course nausea and vomiting so how, what do we do to diagnose them uh, ionic calcium is advised in all cancer present uh, patients at presentation pth that is parathyroid hormone should be done phosphorus and vitamin d should be checked how do we manage immediately start a bolus saline or saline infusion uh, we add dexa wherever necessary loop diuretics like furosemide is given especially after every 1 liter of normal saline at least 20 mg of lasix should be given and we have to strictly follow the urine output potassium and magnesium wherever feasible bisphosphonate should be given a newer drug that is a monoclonal antibody ca uh, called dinuzumab has also been given from time to time and calcitonin can be added if there is refractory severe hypercalcemia next is tumor lysis syndrome well there is an important triad of hyperuricemia where the uric acid is more than 8 hyperkalemia when the potassium is more than 6 and hypophosphatemia when the phosphate is more than 4.5 what what happens most of these patients will have renal failure and hypokalemia calcemia which can also cause hypocalcemic tetany and it's symptomatic hypocalcemia why does it happen when there is rapid destruction of tumor cells causing clogging of the uh, kidneys this can happen very commonly in leukemias lymphomas and myelomas it can again occur in small cell lung cancer and germ cell tumor an indirect measure includes increased in ldh uric acid and creatinine cardiac arrhythmias can be noted because of hypocalcemia or hyperkalemia we may require treatment of tetany if there is hypocalcemia and of course renal failure needs to be managed so the important thing here is prophylaxis we have to prevent tumor lysis then manage tumor lysis and how do we manage uh, prevent tumor lysis when we have a suspicion of tumor lysis like like in leukemia lymphoma or small cell lung cancer we start with vigorous prehydration here only normal saline again can be used until now alkalinization of urine was the important modality where urine ph should have been maintained to less than 7 or more than 7 but this concept seems to be debated now and use of soda bicar again is a very debated and controversial issue but vigorous prehydration use of allopurinol and careful metabolic monitoring is the key tibuxostat again as antioxidase inhibitor is a newer drug which is safer and can also be used how do we treat tumor lysis syndrome 
one key drug for management of tumor lysis syndrome is rasburicase which is given as a single dose or repeated for the next 3 to 5 days in the dose of 0.15 to 0.2 mg per kg body weight given once a day it is contraindicated when there is g6pd deficiency and it can cause hemolysis so this remains the only important precaution uh then again uh, what internist very commonly will see is a patient who's already on chemotherapy and has neutropenic fever so what is the technical definition of febrile neutropenia well it is fever and neutropenia where fever is defined as a single oral temperature of 101 degree fahrenheit here we have to remember its oral temperature because most of our nursing staff will tell us an axillary temperature which may have a 1 degree fahrenheit error so it's a single uh, oral temperature of 38.3 degree centigrade or persistent fever of more than 1 hour of 100.4 degree fahrenheit along with this there has to be neutropenia and neutropenia is de defined as absolute neutrophil count of less than 1000 less than 1500 where severe uh, neutropenia is defined as anc of less than 500 so what are the things to remember well it's a recoverable medical emergency we have to remember that elderly patients and patients on steroids may not have fever and so we have to look for other signs like tachycardia or hypotension uh, some patients may actually have hypothermia hypotension and suddenly unexplained clinical de uh, deterioration the key is to define whether it's a low risk neutropenia or a high risk neutropenia and every patient would require a broad spectrum antibiotic now this broad spectrum antibiotic could either be oral or iv so what needs to be determined to find out whether it's low risk or high risk neutropenia the degree of neutropenia the duration of neutropenia whether it has been more than 7 days where there where has been a rapid decline of absolute neutrophil count whether the cancer is in remission or not and what are the comorbidities like uncontrolled diabetes or cardiac comorbidities which can suddenly cause hypotension and whether their patient has a central line or not or was there any use of monoclonal antibodies so what we have to remember is 30% of all patients will have an identified source that is we can actually figure out which bacteria or what fungal infection was noted and which caused fever but 80% of the time we make assumptions and endogenous flora is the organism which would have caused febrile neutropenia there are certain specific infections which are noted in the type of cancer like a chronic lymphocytic leukemia will probably have more uh, functional asplenia and encapsulated organism as the infection lymphomas will have intracellular pathogens and a person who is on high dose steroids may actually have a pneumocystis carna infection so these things have to be remembered most of the time we should be covering from gram for gram negative as well along with gram positive a pan culture has to be established in which urine blood and throat culture should be done a chest x ray should always be done at baseline we start with cefepim very often with 2 g every 8 hourly growth factor support is necessary that is uh, gcsf or gmcsf when there is established neutro uh, neutropenia vancomycin that is a mrsa cover is given only if there is hypotension if there is severe mucositis and skin infection and when there is a presence of long catheter like a pick line or a chemo port when there is an established mrsa infection or when there has been a long use of quinolones where we give quinolone as prophylaxis also in certain instances uh, an antifungal is added if there is a prolonged fever and prolonged neutropenia more than 5 to 7 days and not resolving with antibacterial viral infections should also be considered and cmv is an important viral infection and of course in our instance now covid infection also needs to be noted catheter removal like a pick line removal or a chemoport removal is advised if the fever is not resolving with antibacterial with this i end my talk thanks so much